book of Acts. Continuing our study through this book, we're going to be in chapter 14 this morning. Paul and Barnabas are continuing their church planting and evangelism mission as those sent out from the church in Antioch. And in this chapter, they actually complete this first missionary journey, as it's been called. I might prefer to call it a church planting journey. This first church planting journey completes in chapter 14. So we're going to walk through this journey that Paul goes through. And I'm going to basically break it into four stages. Four stages, so we'll, we'll read them one at a time, and then I'll comment on them as we walk through it. I, if I was going to title this message, it would be On the Road with the Gospel, because that's really what this this story is about. It, it sees Paul and Barnabas through several different stages. I'm going to break it into four sort of stages of their journey, concluding with their, their final return home to Antioch. We'll study the whole chapter this morning. Before we do that, I want to remember, I was, I was reminded as I was thinking about this journey that Paul takes of, I think it was a year and a half ago, uh, Dustin O'Keefe, who by the grace of God, is back with us from serving our country. Very, very grateful for that. Amen. Let's, let's thank the Lord for that. Very grateful for that. But Dustin, who clearly has a, a highly exaggerated view of my athletic ability, um, asked if I wanted to be a part of, or a number of us wanted to be a part of a, a tough mutter. And um, by the grace of God, things turned out that I, I could not be involved um, <laughs> in that. But I was reminded of that this week, and so I looked up the, the definition of a tough matter. I didn't do this before when he asked me, which is good, because it would have been demotivating. Uh, but the tough mutter apparently is an endurance event series in which participants attempt a 10 to 12 mile long obstacle course that tests mental as well as physical strength. Now, at this point, half of you are going, that sounds amazing, and half are going, that's insane. That's insane. It tests mental as well as physical strength. It was co-founded by Will Dean, a former British counterterrorism officer, and Guy Livingston, a former corporate lawyer. The obstacles often play on common human fears, such as fire, water, electricity, <laughs> and heights. The main <laughs> principle of the Tough Mudder revolves around teamwork. The Tough Mudder organization values camaraderie throughout the course, designing obstacles that encourage group participation. Participants must, must commit to helping others complete the course, putting teammates before themselves and overcoming fears. Now, apparently, speed is not primarily the focus of the Tough Mudder. Apparently, it's endurance, it's perseverance. Four of the typical obstacles that are present. One is an Arctic plunge, where participants plunge into a dumpster filled with ice water, dunk underneath a plank that crosses the dumpster, and pull themselves out on the other side. And if that doesn't delight you, there is electroshock therapy. Live wires hang over a field of mud, which participants must, must traverse. <laughs> then there is the funky monkey, a set of incline and decline monkey bars over a pit of cold water. The bars are slicked with a mixture of butter and mud. And finally, Everest. Participants run up a quarter pipe slicked with mud and grease. Delightful. <laughs> now, I know that... Uh, some of the guys are come up and say, that sounds amazing. Let's go next year. Next spring, there's one in Austin, I'm sure. Let's do it. But what struck me about the Tough Mudder is that whether we would want to do that physically, all of us are actually in an obstacle course race right now. Every Christian has been entered and is running a spiritual life Tough Mudder just as daunting, just as dangerous, just as intense, but actually more valuable because the end is not merely self-confidence boost or some kind of monetary prize or getting your name in the record book. The end is the victory of the gospel of Jesus Christ and our final homecoming to glory. This race 
that we are on, this journey that we are on in the company, in the grip of the advancing gospel is fraught with obstacles, and it is not so much speed that we're called to as endurance, perseverance, overcoming those typical fears that confront every Christian as we walk through this obstacle course called the Christian life in a fallen world. Well, Acts chapter 14 is designed to prepare us for the obstacle course, to inspire us, and to call us to engage it with perseverance. If I could summarize this chapter in a sentence, it would be persevere in the dangerous adventure of the advancing gospel. Persevere in the dangerous adventure of the advancing gospel. It intends to inspire us, to challenge us, to prepare us for that adventure. So let's read it in four different sections, beginning in verse 1. We'll comment on each section as we go. Acts chapter 14, verse 1. Now at Iconium, they, this is Paul and Barnabas, entered together into the Jewish synagogue. This is their practice. And spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But... The unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Section 1, I might caption, Division. It's one of the things we notice immediately that Paul and Barnabas preach with such anointing that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believe... But you notice immediately unbelieving Jews do what they did in previous towns. They stir up the Gentiles, probably the unbelieving Gentiles of the city, and poison their minds against the brothers. So in spite of their anointing, in spite of the effectiveness of their preaching, there is this slander that takes place amongst the townspeople, and and, and they are now opposed to Paul and Barnabas. They are publicly opposed due to this private slander. But you notice in verse 3, the result of this opposition, in verse 3, very important word, so, so they remain for a long time. It it almost seems like Luke is saying, in, in light of the fruit and the opposition they were experiencing, they decided the best thing, what God would want them to do, would be to remain and speak boldly for the Lord. So in facing the obstacle, Paul and Barnabas determined that in light of God's favor on their preaching, coupled with the clear opposition and antagonism of the culture, the best thing to do is to boldly persevere in their preaching task. They're going to persevere in the dangerous adventure of preaching the gospel. They're going to endure. They're going to keep going, it says. And the Lord blesses this determination. It says he grants signs and wonders, likely miracles that are done by their hands, which bears witness to the word of his grace. So they're proclaiming Jesus, the Savior. They're proclaiming salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And as they're proclaiming it, God does miracles through their hands to attest that he is indeed with them. But notice again in verse 4, the people of the city are divided. Some side with the Jews and some with the apostles. And then an attempt is made by Gentiles and Jews to mistreat them and to stone them. And they're forced, in effect, to survive by fleeing to Lystra and Derby. I can't get into all the details that are valuable about this first snapshot, but it's helpful to see this is the effect that we are to expect when we stand for the gospel. There will be fruit, God will bear fruit for his word, and there will be opposition. This is the normal effect of standing for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The normal effect of preaching the word of the Lord is fruitfulness in regeneration and spiritual growth and opposition. So if we're preparing for this particular tough mutter called the Christian life, we need to know ahead of time, this will be experienced by the Christian church. 
This will be experienced. It's not abnormal. It's not unusual. Luke writes this to to let you know this is going to take place for you. If you stand for the word of the gospel of a crucified Messiah, you will see God work powerfully, and he may even attend to your words with, with powerful signs, evidences of his power, but you will also experience the opposition of the culture. So don't be lulled into the assumption that Christianity... And a worldly culture can exist permanently side by side with no antagonism. That's not the expectation of the scriptures. Doesn't mean we antagonize the culture. It means as we stand faithfully for the word, eventually this kind of division is going to take place. Even Jesus said, I do not come to bring peace per se, but a sword. It will divide father from son, brother from brother. And what he meant by that is this preaching of the gospel, it's going to soften some and harden others. Our hope as a church is not ultimately to live a a sort of under-the-radar life that never makes any waves. Our hope is to be faithful in persevering to the gospel and the word of his grace and trust that when these kinds of divisions take place, we will persevere as Paul and Barnabas did. Divisions, the first obstacle that we come to in this journey that Paul and Barnabas are are walking through for the sake of the gospel. Division. Okay, second snapshot. Let's keep reading. They have fled, basically, for their lives to Lystra and Derbe. In verse 8, at Lystra, it says, Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without a witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. You could caption this section, it might be delusion in Lystra. Delusion in Lystra. Division takes place in Iconium. They move on to Lystra. You want to notice at the beginning of this passage the intentional repetition of Paul encountering this crippled man with Peter encountering the crippled man earlier in Acts. So this is Luke setting up the comparison that Paul is going to operate with the same kind of anointing that Peter did at the beginning of the book. Even the vocabulary, he looked intently at him. And seeing that he had faith to to be made well, he said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. So the first thing we want to notice is God is continuing to endorse, as it were, the ministry of his word with profound miracles and power from heaven. Now, I I want to have just a brief aside about healing. The Bible does not promise that every sickness for every Christian will be healed in this life. Even Paul's associate, Timothy, eventually undergoes some kind of stomach ailment. Paul perhaps seems to have a physical limitation. Perhaps his eyesight was made difficult by his journey and fever-infested areas and so forth, they speculate. So it doesn't seem as though Christians should expect that every illness and every sickness should be healed. So we have to have a theology of suffering in a fallen world and hoping for the final restoration of all things in heaven when Jesus returns. However... 
The Bible also says, complementarily, that God has power to heal and that he heals in order to validate the reality of his people and his word. So we as a church believe both of those things. We believe there is sickness and we have to trust the Lord and and facing these kinds of difficulties in a fallen world. My daughter was just asking me, why do you think God made germs? And I said, well, God didn't exactly make germs. I mean, they they came ultimately under his sovereignty, but the fall, and it's confusing. But, But basically there's sickness in the world. And what do we do with that? Well, sometimes we suffer patiently trusting the Lord, but we also pray that God would heal. And that that healing would not merely be for our own comfort, but ultimately for the attestation of his word. That it would reveal that we represent the real God. That we are the ambassadors of the real heavenly God who has power over the things of this earth. Just like he did for this lame man. So as an aside, let's let's not be afraid to pray for healing to the glory of our all-powerful God. Of course we believe that sometimes we suffer in mysterious ways, but we also believe we can pray with faith for God to reveal himself in our midst. Let's do that. It's what Paul did. He prayed for this man that he would be healed. Now they are apparently in this city of Lystra where the mythology of the Greeks rules the day and the inhabitants seeing the man healed assume that these are their mythological gods come down to them in human form. Now, there's a little bit of background to this. Apparently, a generation or so before, there had been reports that the gods had come down in human form and it hadn't gone all that well. And so you get the sense that this town group is saying, well, it's not going to happen now. We are going to treat them right. And so they gather the whole city. They're speaking in their native tongue. And so Paul and Barnabas don't initially understand. And even the priest of Zeus comes out and they're going to offer sacrifices to them. Paul and Barnabas, you notice there in verse 14, are horrified. They tear their clothes which is a a action depicting grief and horror, and rush out into the crowd, crying out, why are you doing these things? And they begin to speak to them the foundational truth that there is a real God who created the heavens and the earth. So there is great spiritual delusion going on in Lystra. They have equated God, the real God's divine power, with these false gods, Zeus and Hermes, and are looking to perpetuate their own religious beliefs attached to the witnesses for the gospel. Now, we should benefit both from Paul and Barnabas' grief and horror and from their message. Now, we, it's, it's unlikely in our post-enlightenment day and age that we are going to encounter, at least in this country, people who literally worship false gods like Zeus and Hermes. It, perhaps we will face a day where that's the case, but it's unlikely. We tend to clothe our idolatry in enlightenment terms, don't we? However, we can learn from the, the horror that Paul and Barnabas display that any human would receive the attention deserving of God alone. We can learn from that. I think there's supposed to be a dramatic effect to the church. The contrast between Paul and Barnabas and Herod earlier in Acts is intentional. They tear their clothes in grief, rush into the crowd, and beg them, stop doing this. This is horrific. They seem to not even pause to consider the potential value of them receiving a certain affirmation. You consider after the fact that they, they, they ran away from Iconium at the threat of being stoned to death, and here they come. Now they're about to be worshipped with sacrifices, but their chief thought is, this is blasphemy to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they rush out into the crowd and appeal to them, we are only men. I think there's a, there's a lesson to be learned that, that part of what it means to persevere in the faith is to persevere in ensuring that Jesus Christ gets all the attention even when the culture and their various beliefs and practices would like to lavish attention on you as a Christian or on a Christian minister. I don't think it's too hard to look into the culture and to see perhaps places where the lesson of Acts 14 in this category is is not being learned well. Where a certain 
popular Christianity that directs attention to a certain human kind of figure, a human prominence, a culturally acceptable model of Christianity that kind of fits into the practices of the day, is accepted and even enjoyed at times by certain Christians and sadly certain Christian ministers. But Acts 14, Paul and Barnabas are desperate that no attention be paid to them that should be paid to Jesus Christ. They will not allow their Christianity to just blend into the idolatry of the culture. And we should not allow it either. There should be a horror whenever we crave a kind of popular Christianity and it keeps us from keeping the attention on Jesus Christ. Let me, let me press this a little deeper. I think in this current era of our Christianity in this country, there is a great temptation to idolize a, a kind of Christian prominence and power politically and socially that for some period of time we had under the prominence of God. And if God allows us to re- continue to have it, then wonderful. That'll protect and preserve us. However, however, that prominence and popularity should not be held on to at all costs. And if our standing for the name of Jesus means we have to let go of that kind of cultural prominence and popularity, let's learn a lesson from Paul and Barnabas. No, we will, we will not allow you to focus on us if that means you are distracted from Jesus Christ. And again, unlikely we're going to be worshipped. But we could be accommodated we could be focused on, if, if only we'd be a little more compromising, if only we wouldn't be quite so concerned about the stark difference between modern paganism and Christianity. Paul and Barnabas say, absolutely not. We are Jesus men. We are word men. And we are horrified that you would accommodate us unless you understand that we are all about Jesus and his glory. Don't you dare focus on us. We can learn something from their zeal, their desperation that Jesus would receive all the glory without exception. We can also learn from their message. I think in in our post-Christian, post-Bible age, Paul's message here, beginning in verse 15, is very helpful for us. You notice how different it is from the message he gives to the Jewish synagogue. Did you notice that? He doesn't talk about David. He doesn't talk about Abraham at all. Did you notice that? He talks about God and how God made the heavens and the earth and the sea. He's basically doing what's called natural theology. He's looking at the earth and he's saying, look, I I want you to know that God, God made all of these things. You can look at nature and you can feel and see the reality of God. He'll write this in Romans 1 when he says, look, people look at the world and they know, deep down they know there's a God. They know there's a God. They don't know what his name is. They don't know how he can save them. They don't know the name of the Redeemer, but they know there's a God. They know in their conscience there is a God and he made all these things. That They're aware of that in their conscience at some level. And even if they reject it or refuse it or don't listen to it, it's there, that voice speaking to them, there is a God. And Paul discerns, look, these Lyconians, uh, they're used to worshiping Zeus, okay? So they don't know anything about Abraham, no idea about David and the coming kingship. Okay, we got to start a different place. There is a real God and he made everything around you and he's been exceedingly patient, Paul says. This God has allowed the nations, in verse 16, to go their own way, but he didn't leave himself without a witness. You'll notice, he says, that there's been rain from heaven and fruitful seasons satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. There's a lot we can learn from Paul's message. We're supposed to be persevering in the faith. That means encountering people who have no biblical background. You have people around you that have no biblical background. They may not be Greek mythologists, but they are modern American Christians who never went to Bible class. But they can see the sun. And they can see the sky. And they can listen to an argument that says, have you noticed how surprising it is that the world operates on a very consistent order? Have you noticed that? Have you ever thought about the fact that the sun rises every morning? Isn't that odd? Why do you think it does that? 
Why, why is, hasn't there been an asteroid that destroyed the earth? Why hasn't there been a, a certain season of time where all the crops happen to fail in all the world simultaneously? Why, why do you think there, there hasn't been in the last multiple thousands of years that we can register history an, an ice age? Isn't it interesting that, that though there's changes ultimately in, in climate and so forth, it, it, it doesn't seem as though they do a, a devastating effect to just basic life on earth. Why do you think that is? Well, actually, the Bible says that there's a God that keeps all of those things running, that preserves the earth. And have you also noticed how there's just good things in the world? Isn't that surprising given how selfish people are? And, and you know, I mean, you're like me. I'm, I can be selfish too. But somehow, we still experience good things. Why do you think it is that people have a certain de delight in good things like family and relationships and, and a sunset? I, I think it's because God gives us those things. And I know that God. And I think if Paul would have had a chance, he would have continued to say, you know what, that God, he, he actually came to earth and he gave himself to pay for that going its own way that all the nations did. He died on a cross to pay for those sins and to invite us back into relationship with him. So the God that knows heaven and earth invites you into a relationship with him if you believe in his son, Jesus Christ. I think you can see how even in, in, in our community, that kind of conversation might actually be a wiser way to get to the gospel than talking about Isaiah 53 or the Davidic kingship. There's wisdom in Paul's laying the foundation of the gospel here. So if, if we're going to persevere in this adventure of the gospel, one of the things we have to learn how to do is dealing with the Lyconian delusion. And the modern versions of it, which focuses on anything but the God of the Bible. Part of perseverance means discerning the particular needs, the particular background of our gospel witness today. And learning from Paul in how to speak into that delusion with gospel invitation. Second stop, the Lyconian delusion. This delusion is dangerous precisely because it is so fickle. It is so fickle. You notice in verse 19, the crowds go from almost worshiping Paul to then stoning Paul and leaving him for dead. Let's take a lesson from this. Remember, we're on this tough mutter. We're on this Christian race. We need to take a lesson from this. This is very true in the culture right now. The culture can change quickly from honoring and appreciating certain aspects of the faith to opposing and even considering it dangerous. Popularity is temporary for Christians. Cultural accommodation is temporary. It cannot be assumed. It cannot be counted on. And Christians cannot hope that, I hope we can just kind of survive in a sort of popular cultural context. Perhaps, but perhaps not. Because what Paul experienced was in one moment he's saying, please don't sacrifice to me. And the next moment they are dragging him out of the city and stoning him. And part of what it means to be in shape for the Christian faith, for the Christian race, is to be ready at a given moment to rush out and demand that they not give you the honor that Jesus deserves, and the next moment to trust Jesus as you're being stoned to death. See how Paul had to face both tests, one right after the other? One moment he has a test of prosperity. They're worshiping him. And he has to make sure that the glory goes to the Lord. The next moment he has a test of persecution. They're stoning him. And he has to trust himself to the Lord as he falls apparently unconscious to the ground. Brothers and sisters, this is the Christian life. This is what it means to be on the road with the gospel. One moment you're being applauded for your integrity at work. The next moment somebody's accusing you that since you're a Christian, you shouldn't be allowed to work there. One moment your family is celebrating your children and how you've trained them in certain values. The next moment they're belittling you for your pro-life beliefs. One moment you're told that it, it's, it's wonderful how kind of much you serve and give into your community. The next moment you're being told that your beliefs about sexuality are dangerous and offensive. You can see in a modern era how quickly this swing could take place. 
One moment you're the centerpiece of a community serving your people faithfully in a certain business. The next moment you're being sued because you were standing up for your convictions. This is the Lyconian delusion taking place in a modern era. Brothers and sisters, we must be prepared for it so that we can persevere in the dangerous adventure of the gospel advance. Okay, third snapshot. Third snapshot. After Paul is apparently revived, he didn't die, they thought he was dead, but the disciples gathered around him in verse 20. He rose up, he enters the city. This just strikes me. On the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. (laughs) It's incredible. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. I caption this next phase of the journey, endurance. Endurance. Number of points that jump out about endurance. First of all, that Paul doesn't stop right after he's been stoned. He immediately gets up and goes on. To, and Paul was a remarkable servant of the Lord. What, a, what an, wouldn't, wouldn't you think, I mean, in, in an American mindset, if there ever was a time for a sabbatical, <laughs> it is after you have been stoned. If there ever was a time for a long vacation, it's after you fell unconscious from people stoning you in the town. If there ever was a time for a day off, a little me time, some entertainment moment, this was the time for Paul. What does he do? He gets up, he says, well, we got to go to Derby. Let's go to Derby the next day. I mean, you can imagine the guy saying, Paul, you were just stoned. Take a day off. It's okay. Paul's like, we got stuff to do. Let's go. Let's move. Let's go to Derby. Then he gets there. He makes many disciples. And notice his message to the church, I'm sure aided by his own example, is to encourage them to continue in the faith. So he goes to Derby. He, he, he makes many disciples. He preaches the gospel again. People are converted. And then he says, I know what I want to do. I want to go back through those towns where I was just persecuted and make sure those disciples are strengthened for endurance. Now, this is lunacy. This is lunacy. He was just stoned, apparently, to death. And he decides, I want to go back there because I want to make sure those Christians are strengthened to endure. Now, now, Paul was a missionary, but in some ways that's an unhelpful term because he wasn't just a missionary. Paul was never merely concerned with proclaiming the gospel. He wanted the gospel proclaimed, and then he wanted the witness enduring in local churches. That's why I prefer the term church planting travels. Church planting. Paul never just preached and left. He preached and built. He established. And then he returned. You notice that here. You notice that in other places in Acts. He returned to strengthen, to establish, to stabilize. And specifically what he wants to stabilize them with is this message. Through many tribulations, tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. He wants to prepare them for this. These young Christians that have already experienced great persecution, he wants to strengthen them and to prepare them. It's only through many tribulations that we will enter that glorious kingdom. The Christian race is not paved smoothly. It is a rough road with many obstacles. It follows in the footsteps of a crucified Messiah. And as they persecuted him, they will persecute you. And Luke and Paul want the churches to know, look, be prepared for the difficult journey of the gospel. Be prepared for the challenging obstacles. Be prepared because this is what it means to be a Christian. It is only on this rough road that ultimately Christians will enter heaven. So he urges them, continue, endure in the faith. Don't give up. Don't lose your zeal. Don't lose your convictions. Don't abandon the name of Jesus. Don't look for the easy and broad road. Follow Jesus on the narrow path that may be hated by the culture and you may have stones flying in your direction, but get up and keep walking because through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. 
And you notice he's determined that these churches would be established and endure, and so he appoints elders for them in every church. Paul is not interested in having a revival meeting that doesn't last through the next year. He wants to raise churches so there's an enduring witness in these communities. He wants churches that will stand for the gospel, taught by elders who will preach the gospel, and prepared for suffering, which they will face in the coming days. So with prayer and fasting, they commit them to the Lord in whom they had believed. But Paul's, Paul's goal is endurance and enduring witness in these communities. He, he's not doing these missionary journeys uh, just to be impressive to the church in Antioch. He wants an enduring witness. It's one of the reasons as Sovereign Grace Churches, we, we put such a premium on church planting, church establishment. So even when we, we send people around the world, our goal ultimately is a church being established because that's the pattern we see in Acts. We want to establish a church, an enduring community. We don't want to stop until there are pastors on the ground who will stay there and keep teaching. That's why when, when we send short-term missions, like we sent jo Janice and Josh and Kirsten, we're sending them to a place where we know that there's going to be an enduring witness there. So Barnabas, the man that has planted many churches in Nepal, we're going to help him and support him and make sure those churches are going to stay there. Because in Acts, there's an emphasis on endurance, the enduring perseverance for the faith. Not a, not a flashy meeting, that doesn't endure, a, an established church that continues in the faith. Brothers and sisters, we need to hear Paul's words to these churches in Antioch and Iconium, Lystra and Derbe, to listen to his words. Only through many tribulations will we enter the kingdom of God. Are we prepared for that? I mentioned this before that the, the proving ground for big tests of endurance is little moments of endurance. I was watching a uh, cartoon with my kids recently. I think it's an old Pixar one, but I hadn't seen it. And so we're watching it. And in the storyline, mankind has ruined Earth and is off on a spaceship somewhere where they've been there for like 700 years. And the computer does everything for them, apparently, in the storyline. And, and so much so that they don't even walk anymore, the humans on this spaceship. So they're just these kind of blobby uh, men and women, and they're on these chairs, and they just cart them around and do everything for them. They don't know how to walk. They don't know how to, and it's supposed to be this kind of like revolting moment where humankind has become just, they, they, they can't do anything for themselves. And the turning point in the show is when the captain of the ship finally says, I don't just want to survive. I want to live. And so he revolts against the machines and the, the ship and so forth. And they, they kind of take back humanity and return to earth. And, and I was thinking about that and I, I thought about all of us, in seeing that and imagining that, there's something in us that should have something of a, I, I don't want to be that either. I, I, I don't want to be useless. I, I don't want to so crave ease and comfort that I, I'm, not, I'm not toughened for the race. I, I don't want to be dehumanized to the point of, of not able to fight the good fight? I, I don't want that. That's, that's not how God made me to be. It's not how I was remade in the image of Jesus to be. Well, what that means is we need to endure to persevere in the little moments on this journey with the gospel. We need endurance for the gospel in our fight with sin. We need endurance for the gospel in our faithfulness to our marriage. We might like to think that we would stand strong facing a hail of stones because we believe in Jesus, but it's really hard to stand for the gospel in loving your spouse, but we would be deceived. We have to stand for the gospel 
In the way Ephesians 5 tells us, husbands loving their wives, wives respecting their husbands, we have to endure in the gospel in that moment. We have to endure for the gospel in our parenting, rejecting mere moralism or mere permissiveness and standing for a proclamation of the good news of Jesus to the next generation. We have to endure for the gospel in our integrity at work. This world promotes money and wealth and power. It does not promote integrity and righteousness. But in little moments, we must stand for the gospel. We have to stand for the gospel in our evangelistic efforts and not become sort of armchair Christians who applaud people who go to far reaches of the world to preach the gospel but are unwilling to start that next conversation. Brothers and sisters, I know many of you have been a Christian as long as I have or longer. And as the decades roll on, it is tempting to assume that armchair Christianity is sufficient as long as we don't commit anything too terribly evil. But that is not the Christianity we are called to. And whether you are six years old or 66 years old, you are called to the dangerous adventure of the gospel advance. And you are never too young and never too old to live life the way Paul and Barnabas did in your own local community, standing for the faith and the word and the rules of the gospel that, stand, that basically say we live for Jesus and not for ourselves. The law of Christ that calls us to him and outside of our own selfishness. That declares that our trust is in grace alone and not in our own efforts. That rejects legalism and license. That lives for the name of Jesus Christ and stands up and declares itself to be, I am a witness for the gospel. And rejects a kind of armchair Christianity that tries to float through life without too much trouble. Final snapshot, celebration. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia, and when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia, and from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done for them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. This is their homecoming. On the way home, they're still preaching the word. And when they get there, what they do is they kind of gather the church together and they begin declaring all that God had done. Look what God did. And the focus of it seems to be that he opened a door of faith for the Gentiles. He, he, he uses this, Paul uses this image of a door to indicate that, that God had done something that man could not do. That Paul and Barnabas on their own could have been knocking at the doors to the Gentiles forever and no one would have come to answer. But God opened the door and they were able to walk through it and proclaim the gospel and multitudes of Gentiles had come to the faith. So there's this celebration that's taking place. And there should be, I think, at this point in Acts, a, a sort of a, a joyful sense of a homecoming celebration. It, you, you get this sense of Paul and Barnabas after many, many, many months away, miles and miles, hundreds of miles that they've, they've traveled. They finally make their way home. And, and here they come into the church meeting. Try, try to imagine this, man. No, no electronic communication, no driving, no flying. And here come Paul and Barnabas into this church meeting. And they begin to say, well, we, we went and you wouldn't believe Paul was stoned and then over here we, we preached to the synagogue but then the Gentiles came in they were thrilled but then the Jews were, were disappointed and they were bitter and, and jealous and so they began to throw us out we had to, to flee quickly we, we went down to the next town they were going to sacrifice to us and the next minute before we knew it Paul was being stoned and, and you wouldn't believe what happened but so many people have believed and the Gentiles have turned to the Lord and there's churches in all these cities now and they have pastors and right now they are hearing the gospel this Sunday morning even as we gather. And you can feel the joy the church would have had in that kind of a moment. It's, it's a sort of a, a, a premonition 
of the joy that every Christian will experience when we come home. Now, their journey isn't done yet. They're going to go on more journeys for the gospel. We'll read about what happens there. But I think it's, it's important to pause. We're talking about perseverance through most of chapter 14, and it's intentional, I think, in Luke that he, he reserves this snapshot at the end of such a difficult journey. Because I think it's true for every Christian, every Christian who perseveres like Paul and Barnabas and every church like these churches enduring these communities, one day there will be a great homecoming. And one day, this is what we will be doing. We will be celebrating what the Lord has done with them. We will be sitting around and declaring to one another, do you remember what God did? Do you remember what he did to open that door? Do you remember how he allowed his gospel to advance? Do you remember what he did? And brothers and sisters, we need to have our eyes fixed on that day. You need to have your eyes fixed on that day. Because it'll motivate this day when we're still on the journey. On that day when we do what they did and the great church gathers around and declares what God has done with them, opening the door of the gospel in the world. We want to be sitting there swapping stories with saints throughout the ages on that day, don't we? Don't you want to be sitting there swapping stories of God's faithfulness to use his church to proclaim his gospel and to build up the saints and allow them to endure? I want to be sitting there on that day with you swapping stories of God's faithfulness. God built his church. God reached the lost. Do you remember that neighbor you reached out to and, and here he is. Remember the day he was baptized? And do you remember that, that person you served in your small group and it was a testimony to the community? And do you remember how God moved mightily in that one sermon series and God moved as a revival among us and helped us to grow in holiness and, and stand for his word? And do you remember how he, he used us to reach out and, and to send those people on that church plant. Do you remember what God has done with us? One day, brothers and sisters, we will be sitting in a homecoming and we will be sharing stories like this with one another. And that is why it's a joy to persevere today. To persevere in serving, to persevere in witnessing, to continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that we heard. I want you to imagine something as we conclude this message. Pick a single part of your life right now that you're tempted to surrender rather than endure. If it's a particular area of growth, a particular aspect of witness, a particular relationship, a particular fellowship, you're tempted to surrender rather than endure, to persevere. And let's imagine the joy we will experience when on that day, we can look into each other's eyes and you can recount the grace of God in a victory for the gospel through the means of the enduring church as it relates to that one area in your life. We all have areas where it's tempting to surrender rather than endure. But one day, there's going to be a great homecoming and we're going to celebrate all those areas where by the grace of God, we will be able to persevere. Let's persevere together. It is a dangerous adventure. But there is a homecoming awaiting us, just like when Paul and Barnabas walked into that church meeting in Antioch. I think Luke wants us to feel that motivation. Let's persevere until that day comes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we ask for your grace that we would persevere faithfully. Lord, as we face daunting obstacles of faith and of integrity, obstacles without and within, that you would sustain us, that you would build us together, that you would use us for the proclamation of your kingdom, for standing for your truth, for living for your glory. But I pray for any brothers and sisters who have been tempted by a, a certain element of surrender 
to surrendering to the flesh, surrendering to temptation, surrendering to a sort of armchair Christianity. Lord, I pray that you would impart your spirit right now to them, that you would fill this church with your spirit, and that every individual would long to give their life passionately for you. Lord, prepare us for suffering. Prepare us for the test of popularity. Use us for the advance of your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.